Well, welcome everyone uh, to the virtual world of the Eastside Freedom Library and our partners, the Ramsey County Historical Society. I'm Peter Ratcliffe, the co-executive director of the Freedom Library. Um, we have been doing these monthly history revealed programs. Um, we did a little counting tonight and, and we figure it's been three years in person, then online, soon we hope back to in person. Um, we have greatly enjoyed working with our colleagues at the Ramsey County Historical Society um, and bringing our two communities of people interested in history together. Uh, the Eastside Freedom Library's mission is to inspire solidarity, work for justice and advocate for equity for all. Um, Knowing where we have come from helps us figure out how to get where we want to go. And I think what we're going to hear tonight from Anna Peterson is going to give us a lot to think about how we can move forward in positive and progressive directions. So I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Robin Priestley. Um, oh, I also want to just say thank you to my colleague, Carla Reilly who is rendering herself simultaneously invisible and absolutely necessary to the work that we do by handling the technology. So Robin, it's all yours. Thank you, Peter. As Peter said, we've been partnering with the Eastside Freedom Library for three years now, and it's always a wonderful experience. And we're so happy to be able to bring you the wide range of programs, authors, historians, speakers on a variety of topics on our collaboration with the Eastside Freedom Library. So tonight, we wanna to thank you all for coming and listening to Anna Peterson on the Scandinavian Women's Suffrage Association of Minnesota. This is part of our exhibition on suffrage that is up on our website. So please check out rchs.com. The address is down in the lower left on the slide. And you can also see upcoming programs. Um, this program will be recorded and will be available on our RCHS YouTube channel, as well as the Eastside Freedom Library's YouTube channel in a couple days. So during the program, some technical reminders, please keep your microphones and personal cameras turned off and feel free to type your questions and comments in the chat at any time. We'll have questions at the end of the program and then after the question and answer time, um, Carla will turn off the recording and you may turn on your microphones and cameras so we can all chat together. So please consider supporting the Ramsey County Historical Society and the Eastside Freedom Library. We rely on the support of members and friends like you to continue to present these programs and all of our efforts. And both organizations have some great benefits to joining. RCHS has our quarterly magazine, Ramsey County History, um, which has been an award-winning magazine, and you would receive that as part of your membership. And our historic site, Gibbs Farm, up on the corner of Larpenter and Cleveland, is now open this summer, which is very exciting after being closed last year. And it's open Fridays and Saturdays. So check on the website for that. Um, and then also on the website, of course, there's information on how to do donate, how to join, and much more. So I want to put forward that on Tuesday, June 22nd, we have a very special History Revealed program with Professor Carlos Hill, who will be sharing his new book on the Tulsa Massacre, which took place 100 years ago, uh, May 31st. So that will be a really important program, and we hope that you all can join us for that. Um, signing up, registration information, and more information on the program is, again, both on the RCHS website and the ESAC Freedom Library website. So acknowledging the sacred Dakota land, Minnesota Makoche, the land where the waters are so clear, they reflect the clouds as the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. It is also home to the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledges that its sites are located on and benefit from these sacred Dakota lands. RCHS is committed to preserving our past, informing our present and inspiring our future. Part of so doing so is acknowledging the painful history and current challenges facing the Dakota people just as we celebrate the, contribu the contributions of the Dakota and other indigenous people. 
You can find our full land acknowledgement statement on our website, which includes actionable ways which Ramsey County Historical Society pledges to honor the Dakota and other indigenous people of Minnesota Mekoche. So RCHS is committed to presenting the stories and histories of all in our community. And we are so pleased to bring you tonight's program on suffrage and the work that the Scandinavian Women's Associ Suffrage Association of Minnesota did in that. So let me introduce Anna Peterson. We're so delighted to have her here. Um, Anna M. Peterson is Associate P Professor of History at Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. She also serves as editor for the Norwegian American Historical so Association. Let me just get this slide up. There we go. Um, and Anna's many publications include two articles on the Scandinavian Women's Suffrage Association published in Minnesota History and the Journal of American Ethnic History. So thank you, Anna, and welcome. Thank you. And thank you to the Ramsey County Historical Society and the Eastside Freedom Library for hosting tonight. Um, my information is up on the screen there, and I'll put that up um, at the end of the presentation as well. You'll see that my email address is at the bottom. Um, take note of that. You're welcome to email me with any questions that come up for you, maybe later tonight or tomorrow or three weeks from now, whenever it is. So don't be afraid to reach out with that email address there. And just a, oh, I'll keep, you could, yeah, that's that. fine. So Robin is doing the slides for me because I'm having some tech issues. So you'll kind of notice that I'll be pointing out some places where she can advance the slides there too. So thank you. Um, all right. With the ratification of the 19th Amendment in August of 1920, women won the right to vote in the United States. For decades, women across the country had been marching, lobbying, even going on hunger strike in an effort to persuade lawmakers and the public to support women's suffrage. Alongside well-known suffragists, people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul, Carrie Chapman Catt, some of these names might be familiar to you. Alongside these women, women from a wide variety of ethnic, racial, and class backgrounds participated in this political movement. Their work was essential to the realization of votes for women in 1920. These women used what connections they had to try and convince men at the local, state, and federal level to support their right to vote. It's therefore perhaps not so surprising that in a state like Minnesota, where immigrants made up a large percentage of the population, suffragists formed an ethnic women's suffrage club, the Scandinavian Women's Suffrage Association, or I'll be referring to it tonight as the SWSA, Scandinavian Women's Suffrage Association. And so you can see a picture here with the, them holding the banner there. I'll be talking tonight about the formation of the club, the club's membership, some of its activities, and the environment that they operated within. And we'll just stay on this slide for a little bit, Robin. It may not have been surprising that Minnesota was home to an ethnic club like the SWSA. Certainly, we can understand this decision as strategic, but it was unusual. Within the American suffrage movement, racial, class, and ethnic divisions ran deep. Some of the most prominent suffrage organizations at the time were mainly comprised of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant women from the upper and middle classes. These suffragists often painted people from other backgrounds as a threat to their political goals and didn't always recognize them as kind of equal suffragists in the fight. In spite of this, indigenous women, Latinas, African-Americans, and immigrants from around the world, among others, participated in the women's suffrage movement and influenced its outcome. That's why I'm glad to be giving this talk tonight in conjunction with the work the Ramsey County Historical Society has been doing to highlight the diversity of the women's suffrage movement through their suffrage exhibition, Persistence, Continuing the Struggle for Suffrage and Equality, 1848 to 2020, and their History Revealed series, which they're doing in collaboration with the Eastside Freedom Library. Minneapolis and St. Paul were home to many suffrage clubs in the early 20th century, including the Minnesota Women's Suffrage Association and the Political Equality Club. But the SWSA was the only ethnic suffrage organization in the area. It was the president of the Political Equality Club, Dr. Ethel Hurd, who formed the SWSA in 1907 to take advantage of the potential lobbying power such a club would have in the heavily Scandinavian populated state of Minnesota. 
As later president of the club, Nanny Matson Yeager described, the SWSA, quote, served as a sort of special committee in the general suffrage work, end quote. This special committee augmented the work of other suffrage organizations through its appeal to Scandinavian Americans' ethnic heritage. In doing so, they had to navigate a climate of intense nativism and anti-immigrant sentiment present both inside and outside the women's suffrage movement. How did they do this? And that's some of what I'll be talking about tonight. I'm gonna to remind you of this later in the talk, but I also wanna just tell you up front that my main argument is that they were able to do this because the unique position of suffrage movements back in Scandinavia and the construction of Scandinavian American ethnicities built on ideals of progress, equality, and liberty enabled Scandinavian American suffragists to successfully marshal their ethnicity to attract more suffrage association members and legislative supporters. Before we go any further, I wanna take a minute to talk about my use and their use of the designator Scandinavian. And I'll have you go to the next slide, Robin. In the United States, immigrants from the Scandinavian countries of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, and you see those three flags flying there, they often found it useful to band together, employing the umbrella identity of Scandinavian, particularly in political contexts. And sometimes you would also see representatives from the Nordic countries, including Finland and Iceland, joining in as well. A Scandinavian organization allowed for larger numbers of potential members than nationally based organizations. When combined, Scandinavians made up the largest immigrant group in Minnesota. Thus, a united Scandinavian club made it possible to create a larger organization that might achieve greater political power. Outside the Scandinavian milieu, it was also quite common to associate Norwegians, Swedes, and Danes as one ethnic group. Similar languages, customs, and histories led many Anglo-Americans to refer to the various Scandinavian nationalities as if they were interchangeable, much to many Norwegians, Swedes, and Danes' chagrin. The formation of a consolidated Scandinavian suffrage association took advantage of this misconception to create a larger, more cohesive lobbying group. This does not mean that there were not tensions within organizations such as these, there certainly were. It also doesn't mean that the organization was equally comprised of Norwegian, Swedes, and Danes. In fact, the SWSA's makeup and character seemed to shift with whatever national identity the president of the association held. And I'll have you go to the next slide, Robin, where we can see the two presidents of the SWSA on the left, Genova Martin, and on the right, Nanny Matson Yeager. When Norwegian born Genova Martin was president from 1907 to 1913, the association was decidedly Norwegian American in the people it appealed to and the activities it promoted. When Nanny Matson Yeager, a Swedish American, took over in 1913, there was a definite change in the attitude and membership of the club. It now tended to, or then tended to skew more Swedish American. And I'll get to talking more about these leaders of the SWSA in a bit. But since I started talking about membership, I want to tell you a little bit more about the membership of the SWSA because it's pretty interesting um, in terms of what we know about other suffrage organizations. It's during Jaeger's tenure that we have the most information on the club's membership because her papers held at the Minnesota Historical Society's archives include 178 membership cards um, from her time as president. And you can advance the slide. We can see here on the next slide, here we go, one of these membership cards. And I'll get to talking about the different pieces of it in a minute, but I'll just point out right now that you can see the name line and the address line. So everyone wrote down the name, their name and address. And I cross-referenced the names and addresses on the membership cards with the US Census so that I could better understand the organization and its membership, who exactly were the people who were signing their name here, who exactly was interested in this type of organization. Officially, membership of the SWSA was restricted to first and second generation Scandinavian Americans. Individuals from outside Scandinavia were not allowed to join. And the data bears this out. 
First and second generation Norwegian and Swedish Americans represented over 87% of the total membership during Jaeger's presidency. Only two names on the membership cards belong to Danish Americans. And the few number of Danes may be explained by their propensity for greater assimilation rates, or again, may have to do with the connections of the presidents of the organization, and there never was a Danish American president of the SWSA. There is only a slight difference in terms of the generational structure of the SWSA, suggesting that native-born and American-born Norwegians and Swedes found the organization to be equally appealing. And this is pretty interesting because it means that immigrants who arrived in the US with still strong connections back to the homeland were as likely to be members as their children, who we often think of as already having been assimilated or wanting to distance themselves from ethnic affiliations. That's not the case with the SWSA. Um, the second generation you know, wasn't afraid to be ethnically identified or wasn't afraid to join this ethnic affiliation. Those who fulfilled the criteria of being able to claim Scandinavian heritage were accepted as members and did not have to pay membership dues. And you can see that on the card, after it says every woman's cause. And after that, it says no dues required. The absence of fees contributed to the overall economic diversity of the club. While a number of the SWSA's female members, especially its officers, were wives of prominent Scandinavian American men in the Minneapolis St. Paul community, women from working class backgrounds, as well as single working women also joined the club. While married women's occupations on the census were often listed as housewife, their husband's occupations indicate what economic circumstances these women lived within. So some of um, what we can know about their economic background. Most SWSA members came from households that received money from skilled occupations, such as electricians or foremen at work sites. While the majority of these men had either received occupational training or amassed enough experience to warrant a kind of supervisory position or a white collar position, Many of the members also came from households where men worked as laborers. In fact, the absence of membership fees may help explain why just as many of the SWSA's member households receive their income from laborer occupations as professional occupations. For example, the wife of a bricklayer was as likely to be a member as the wife of a lawyer or doctor. And again, this is interesting because when we tend to think of suffragists, we tend to think of suffragists who are upper, upper middle class, who have professional backgrounds themselves. Um, many were doctors like Dr. Ethel Hurd, some of them were lawyers, or they were married um, to men with these professional backgrounds. That's not the um, majority of members of the SWSA. Men, although not the main targets of the SWSA's recruitment efforts, were also allowed to join, and a few of the women's husbands and children were listed as members of the SWSA. And of the 178 membership cards, 12 of them um, had men's names on them. In terms of age, we also know that younger Scandinavian American women, often faced with responsibilities radically different from older women, became members of the SWSA despite personal obstacles. Single working women did not flock to join the SWSA in greater numbers than did married women who had children. In fact, most of the SWSA's female members were not single working women. The average age of an SWSA member was just over 32, and nearly half of the members had children under the age of 18 living at home in 1910. As I've already indicated, the background of the SWSA's membership is interesting and in that it doesn't conform to what we know or what we think we know about the American women's suffrage movement. Until fairly recently, the scholarly focus has been on the elite Anglo-American leaders of the national movement, which has skewed our understanding of the women who comprised the movement's base and of the organizations that operated at the state and local levels. The diverse membership of the SWSA challenges both these present assumptions as well as past assertions about who suffragists were. At the time of its operation, the SWSA countered anti-suffrage rhetoric that suffragists' demands should not be taken seriously 
by lawmakers or the American public. Anti-suffragists alleged that suffragists were solely upper-class society women whose personal situations did not or could not reflect the majority of American women's needs and desires. Antis contended that just because those types of women wanted to vote didn't mean the common everyday American housewife wanted to vote. For example, in 1915, the Minnesota Anti-Suffrage Association alleged that suffragists were not mothers, but quote, idle, brainless society women, end quote. Ethel Hurd of the Political Equality Club contested this view by documenting the number of Minneapolis Suffrage Club members who worked both inside and outside of the home. Importantly, she pointed to the SWSA as an example of a club, quote, almost entirely composed of practical housekeepers and mothers, end quote. In this way, the SWSA helped disprove a key element of anti-suffrage messaging. While practical housewives and mothers may have made up the majority of the SWSA's membership, there's considerably more known and more to know about the women from the middle or upper classes, as it was these women who typically assumed leadership positions in the SWSA and other organizations and left behind historical records. So let's return now to the two presidents of the SWSA. I'll have you advance the slide. You can go forward one, Robin. Thank you. So Genova Martin, the first president, and Nanny Matson Yeager, the second and last president. While we know considerably more about Nanny Matson Yeager, we do know a few things about Genova Martin. She was perhaps most well known in the Norwegian American community as a writer. She was a poet, an essayist, and a playwright, publishing the five act play Zoraritha. In addition to serving as first president of the SWSA, she also held the position of vice president for the Minnesota Women's Suffrage Association earlier. After her time as SWSA president, she became an outspoken advocate for socialism, and it's believed her husband was of a working class background. More has been published about second president, Nanny Matson Yeager. Born in Red Wing, she attended several years of schooling in Sweden, later becoming the first woman of Scandinavian descent to enroll at the University of Minnesota in 1877. Like Martin, she also served on the executive board of the Minnesota Women's Suffrage Association. She was active in the kindergarten movement and the Women's Christian Association, in addition to her suffrage work. Nanny Matson Yeager came from a politically active and well-connected family. Her father, Hans Matson, was a prominent elected official in Sweden before he emigrated to the US in 1851. After immigrating, Matson became one of the most well-known Swedes in American politics, certainly Minnesota politics. He served at the rank of Colonel in the 3rd Minnesota Regiment, as the first Secretary of the Minnesota Board of Immigration, and as Minnesota Secretary of State in two non-consecutive terms. He also founded several Swedish newspapers in Chicago and Minnesota. Matson was also president of the Scandinavian American Publishing Company. And Nanny's husband, Luth Jaeger, a Norwegian immigrant, worked alongside her father at the Scandinavian American Publishing Company as secretary. Prior to that, Luth was editor of one of the most important Norwegian language newspapers in Minnesota, Budstikken, or The Messenger. Alongside Genova Martin and Nanny Matson Jaeger, many of the SWSA women who came from middle or upper middle class families were involved in prominent organizations in the Scandinavian American communities and the Twin Cities, such as the Lingblomsen Literary Society, and I'll have you advance, we can see a picture of some of the founding members of the Lingblomsen Literary Society. They were members of that and also the Progressive Literary Society, women like Laura Brotager and Helen Egglesrud. These women represented the backbone of the upper middle class Scandinavian American community in Minneapolis, St. Paul. They formed networks of active association women who had ties outside of the framework of the SWSA. This, coupled with the incredible variety of membership backgrounds and ethnic identity of the club, enabled the SWSA to appeal to a different audience than the other suffrage organizations operating in Minnesota. Before I get into some detail about the work of the SWSA, I wanna give you a little context 
about the construction of ethnic identities that was taking place at this time that affected the environment the SWSA was operating within and the tools they had at their disposal. I'll have you advance one. Great. Many scholars have studied how the encounters immigrants and their descendants had with racial and ethnic hierarchies in the United States influenced their efforts at constructing an American ethnicity. Some European ethnic groups, including the Irish and the Italians, struggled to achieve a status of whiteness in the United States. Others, such as immigrants from the Scandinavian countries, encountered less racial prejudice, but as an ethnic group, they were, as all, as all others, keen to establish an identity that supported and justified their claims to inclusion. To do so, Scandinavian Americans often connected past and present examples of their home country's progressiveness to argue that as a group, they were uniquely committed to Amer the American values of democracy, progress, and equality. Both cultural elites and ordinary people participated in this process of identity or myth-making and worked to cultivate and communicate an ethnic identity that Scandinavian Americans could take pride in. In 1925, just five years after the vote was won, Norwegian American women compiled an anthology to help define what exactly constituted a Norwegian American woman. Many of the poems, articles, and biographies that helped establish this definition referenced a Norwegian American progressive identity and connected this to their ability to succeed in the United States. And I'll have you, I think, click once or advance once we'll see. Yep. For example, in the preface to the anthology, Alma Guttersen answered the question of, why are Norwegians so readily assimilated in America? Quite succinctly, because they have little to learn but the language. They bring with them the very ideals and principles and characteristics which make Americanism, end quote. SWSA member Helen Egglesrud elaborated on this in an article she wrote for the compilation entitled Our Ideals, in which she attributed the success of the women's suffrage movement to the quote, racial ideals Norwegians had brought with them to America, naming freedom, honesty, and progress specifically. According to Egglesrud, these ideals should quote, color everything a Norwegian American did and strove for. A letter that grew Svensson, a Norwegian emigrant from Hallingdal, who later became a rural school teacher in Iowa, wrote to a fellow Norwegian American serves as an example of this process at work in everyday life. Svensson explained in her letter, and you can advance the slide. I have praised and defended Norway and things Norwegian so much that I have had heated arguments with some people who believe America is paradise. This statement highlights a desire Svensson and other Scandinavian Americans had to inform others of the positive and what they believed were at times superior elements of their cultural past especially in relation to their current homeland. You can advance the slide. Successful women's suffrage movements in Scandinavia could also serve to bolster claims like these. When Norwegian women won the limited right to vote in 1907 and the universal right to vote in 1913, mythmakers used this as evidence to directly link Scandinavian ethnicity to the ideals of progress, equality, and liberty. Scandinavian Americans could encounter these ideas through their reading of ethnic publications. You can advance the slide. For example, one such publication, the Norwegian, Dano-Norwegian language magazine, Kvinn og Yemma, which means the woman and the home, printed stories that compared the women's suffrage movement in America with agitations for women's enfranchisement in Scandinavia, and in doing so highlighted the accomplishments of Scandinavian suffragists. And you can advance a slide. As editor Ida Hansen wrote in 1909, quote, the Nordic countries are, as everyone knows, number one in granting women's rights, which much larger countries have not even dreamt of granting. This assertion simultaneously identified the Nordic countries as having a superior position in regards to women's rights, while disparagingly pointing out the limited progress of other nations, including perhaps especially the United States, much a much larger country. The mainstream English, Eng Ugh, sorry, the mainstream English language media was also interested in the phenomena 
of Norwegian's seemingly innate tendency to support women's equality efforts. And you can advance. Thank you. Following Norwegian women's suffrage victory in 1907, Albert Gilbertson of the University of Minnesota wrote a two-page article for the Minneapolis Journal explaining the reasons why Norway was a, quote, and you can advance, gynocracy, a land where woman rules, not merely in the proverbial cradle rocking manner, but politically by a full and equal suffrage. Gilbertson ar Gilbertson's article clearly portrayed the Norwegian suffrage movement through rose-colored glasses. Gilbertson romanticized women's position in Norway, reiterating rhetorical arguments that attributed Norwegians' commitment to democratic ideals and their relationship to women's rights as unique. He exaggerated women's political power in Norway, even going so far as to say that Norway was the only place where the, quote, fair sex has supreme power, end quote. His embellishment served a role in highlighting the suffrage cause. The article, published in an English language newspaper, served to remind people of all ethnicities living in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, or perhaps most importantly for our purposes, Norwegian and other Scandinavian Americans, that America was behind Scandinavian countries in the progression of women's rights. It also aided in the construction of a Scandinavian American ethnicity based on progressive ideals. You can advance the slide, please, Robin. Both suffragists and anti-suffragists drew upon existing ethnic and racial frameworks to argue that different ethnic groups either supported or opposed women's right to vote based on their heritage. Anglo-American middle-class women were frequently portrayed as the backbone of the suffrage movement and frequently portrayed themselves as such, while Irish and German Americans were presumed to be ethnically opposed. Due to this assumption, Notable contemporaries, including Harriet Stanton Blatch and Carrie Chapman Catt, claimed that ethnic Americans were a threat to the cause. Suffragists such as these resented that, quote, ignorant immigrant men could vote while native born women could not, and believed that most immigrant men voted against women's suffrage. And suffragist propaganda reflected this. I'll have you advance the slide. We can see an example of this. So you can see on the left, this kind of ambiguous um, immigrant man, probably either Italian, um, sorry, not Italian, Irish or German, I think maybe Irish. You see that he's eyeing that beer very closely, right? They even have that dashed line connecting his eye to the beer and smoking a cigar. He looks kind of dirty, unkept, right? It says this man can vote. And on the right side, we have this kind of regal, white woman, white mother, right, holding this baby. And underneath it says, this woman cannot. Along these lines, suffragists argued that native born women were more deserving of the vote than immigrant men. As one Iowa suffragist claimed, quote, they probably know, meaning immigrant men, probably know little of our American ideals. While Scandinavians had been working for years to counter this very claim, the presence of this thinking within the suffrage movement itself, in addition to the general cultural climate, may have led the SWSA to feel it had something to prove. I'll have you advance the slide. The membership cards used during Jaeger's presidency referenced the existence of the presupposition that there were ethnic predispositions to either support or oppose women's suffrage based along ethnic lines. And they, the membership cards asked potential members to disprove the notion that Scandinavians were not fully in support. Above the line on the form where the new member was to sign her name stood, and I have it kind of highlighted there, Scandinavian women are quite often accused of being indifferent as to their responsibility in securing the ballot. Perhaps this is true, and it is up to us to find out if this is a fact. However, if you're ever so interested, it will not be very effective unless you give your name for moral support. The SWSA also sought to distance themselves from other ethnic groups that opposed women's suffrage by depicting ethnic American opposition to the cause as foolish. 
For example, the SWSA frequently used a poem written by Julia B. Nelson to ridicule the reluctance of certain immigrant groups in the poem, Germans, to support women's equality. I'll have you advance. We can see the poem, this kind of handwritten here. The poem referred to a farmer, Hans Dunderkopf, or idiot Hans, and his contradictory view of women's rights. And I'm gonna take a minute to read this portion of the poem to you so you can get a sense of the type of ethnic humor and stereotypes the SWSA employed. Hans Dunderkopf stood on the stack, his wife stood on the load. An advocate of equal rights came walking down the road. Said he, I have a pipe paper here for all good men to sign who think that women's rights should be the same as yours and mine. Said Hans, I signed that paper door. I always think you see that on them farm, my Frau got right to work so much as me. And it's not me just putting on that strange um, accent, but you can see um, in the handwritten poem there that that's the way that it kind of spelled out the way that he would be talking, the way that Hans would be talking. Dunderkopf believed that women definitely had the right to equally share in farm work, a practice that Anglo-Americans abhorred, but later in the poem could not see why this should be extended to voting. He was appalled at the idea of his wife becoming a man and shouldering the responsibilities that came with that status. This type of suffragist propaganda aimed to portray certain ethnic groups as anti-democracy and thus un-American. The SWSA juxtaposed these stereotypes with claims that Scandinavian Americans were naturally committed to the American ideals of democracy and equality. In this way, the SWSA effectively argued that while some ethnic groups, like the Germans, may be anti-suffrage, Scandinavians should not be, or even could not be, because of their ethnicity. The unique position of the suffrage movements back in Scandinavia and the construction of a Scandinavian American ethnic ethnic identity built on ideals of progress, equality, and liberty enabled Scandinavian American suffragists to successfully marshal their ethnicity to attract more suffrage association members and legislative supporters. And that statement should be familiar to you um, from the beginning of the talk. I'll have you advance the slide. As Nanny Matson Yeager said in her report to the Minnesota Suffrage Convention in 1915, the organization's primary purpose was to use its ethnic makeup to further the American women's suffrage movement and inject a little suffrage spice into the melting pot. The SWSA proudly claimed an ethnic identity as a way to garner support for women's suffrage from both Scandinavians and non-Scandinavians. The organization was an active participant in the suffrage campaign at the local, state, and national levels. In Minneapolis, St. Paul, the SWSA maintained a strong presence in the local cultural and political scene in an effort to gain more suffrage supporters. The club participated in organizational activities, raised money for the Minnesota Women's Suffrage Association, and sponsored Scandinavian American cultural events. In each of these areas, the SWSA demonstrated a keen interest in furthering American suffrage goals while maintaining a distinctly ethnic flair. We can see this at work in the suffrage parade held in Minneapolis on Saturday, May 2nd, 1914. And you can advance a slide. Joining forces with the other Minneapolis St. Paul suffrage organizations, it was a huge parade, you know, over a thousand people. The SWSA had its own section of the parade led by a Swedish American woman. In this photograph taken of the parade, taken of the Scandinavian section of the parade, Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish flags can be seen as women dressed in bunads or traditional costumes marched holding English language signs demanding the vote. These women demonstrated the separate nationalities represented by the SWSA while alerting onlookers to their unified Scandinavian support of an American suffrage cause. A write-up on the front page of the Minneapolis Tribune the next day declared, you can advance, Minneapolis awakes this morning with some distinctly new ideas of those who are engaged in obtaining the right to vote for women, and specifically highlighted the Scandinavian section as a vibrant and festive addition to the parade. 
The SWSA had in its possession a suffrage banner boasting the triumph of Norwegian suffragists that it could use as it, at events such as the suffrage parade. And you can advance a slide, we'll see a picture of it. The words women vote in Norway were imprinted on a white silk banner in large black letters. The sash was made to be pinned to the front of a bunad and was surely meant to persuade onlookers that women in the United States should not be at a disadvantage to women in other countries. The SWSA used similar arguments in their targeting of Scandinavian American members of the Minnesota State Legislature and the US Congress, including Minnesota representatives Ula Sangeng and N.S. Hagnes and US Senator Knutson Nelson. For example, in 1915, Jaeger informed Representative Hagnes, and we can advance the slide. Our Scandinavian Women's Suffrage Association is particularly anxious that no legislator of Scandinavian birth or blood be found less fair-minded toward his sister in this our adopted country than is his brother in the old country. In other words, why should Norwegian women or Danish women, um, by this point in 1915, Danish women had also received the right to vote. Why should Danish women or Norwegian women be able to vote and Norwegian American and Danish American women could not? You can go ahead and advance. The SWSA also arranged cultural events in the metropolitan area. They use these opportunities not only to showcase some Scandinavian culture, but also to draw a crowd that would be inclined to support their cause. When Genova Martin was president, the cultural events reflected the club's dominant Norwegian American membership. For example, on November 13th, 1910, the SWSA hosted an evening of entertainment, which included a play, King Håkon VII, presented by the Norwegian Dramatic Society. The SWSA also arranged annual Midsummer's Eve picnics at Minnehaha Falls and hosted Swedish opera singers. The Minneapolis Morning Tribune announced these events in their paper and, event, and emphasized the presence of national folk costumes and folk dancing in an effort to help draw an audience. One of the largest events the SWSA staged was an evening of dramatical and musical entertainment on February 28th, 1917. And you can see the program from the event here on the slide. The main attraction that night was a well-known Swedish suffragist play, The Prime Minister's Daughters. The newspaper estimated that more than 1,000 people attended this event at Central High School in Minneapolis. The money the SWSA raised from these events helped eliminate the need for membership dues. These fundraisers also aided the SWSA in their efforts to further state suffrage goals. The other Minneapolis suffrage clubs often praised the SWSA for its ability to raise money as an auxiliary organization for the Minnesota Women's Suffrage Association. The SWSA was specifically responsible for raising money for the construction of a suffragist building on the Minnesota State Fairgrounds. And you can advance a slide, we'll see a picture of that building. Oh, one more, there we go. The building called the Women's Citizen Building stood on the fairgrounds where it served as a gathering place for all Twin Cities suffrage clubs. The SWSA's involvement in suffrage club meetings, citywide suffrage events, and Scandinavian cultural events reveals how the members use their unique ethnic affiliation to gain support for women's suffrage. Their ethnicity did not, however, play an overt role in every suffrage activity in which they were engaged. The SWSA probably targeted Scandinavian Americans in their efforts to raise money for the Women's Citizen Building. Yet when the fundraising was completed, the SWSA handed the money over to the Minnesota Women's Suffrage Association. This shows how the club functioned within the state suffrage organizational scheme in ways that took advantage of their Scandinavian heritage and connections. Its ethnic foundation also gave the SWSA the ability to extend its lobbying reach outside the Minneapolis St. Paul area and the state of Minnesota. Go ahead and advance, Robin. Both state level suffrage organizations and the national suffrage campaign could take advantage of the SWSA's employment of ethnic rhetoric in order to rally support from Scandinavian populations across the nation. The SWSA offered its expertise to nearby state suffrage organizations, including North Dakota, 
where Scandinavian immigrants and their descendants made up more than a quarter of the state's population in 1910. The SWSA helped the North Dakota Votes for Women League, and that's who you see in this picture. They helped them learn how to use ethnicity to appeal to the state's Scandinavian population through publishing suffragist arguments in Scandinavian languages and in immigrant newspapers, such as the Norwegian language from in Fargo. In addition, the SWSA served as a qualified ethnic rallying force for the national women's suffrage movement. And you'll advance the slide and we'll see this image that I had up at the beginning and kind of we'll be able to understand it a little bit better. At the national level, the SWSA supported and aligned itself with the more radical suffrage organization, the National Women's Party, or the NWP, earlier called the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage. The rift between the NWP and the more traditional National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA, compelled many suffrage clubs to choose to support either the NWP or NASA based on their identification with either militant or conventional suffrage methods. In Minnesota, most notably, the Minnesota Women's Suffrage Association distanced themselves from the NWP over its controversial tactic of picketing the White House during World War I. Other clubs, including the SWSA and Minnesota branch of the Congressional Union, not only continued to support the NWP after picketing began, but even joined in the picketing during Minnesota Day on the picket line in 1917. This photograph was taken in conjunction with this effort. Women hold the SWSA's banner and the banner for the Minnesota branch of the Congressional Union in front of the NWP's Congressional Union headquarters. The SWSA also chose to maintain a close relationship with the NWP in other ways including financial support and providing advice on recruiting Scandinavian Americans. Alice Paul, chairwoman of the NWP, identified the SWSA as a resource to help cultivate suffrage support amongst Scandinavian Americans across the United States. When the NWP became aware of Scandinavian American communities that needed to be persuaded to support women's suffrage, the organization contacted the SWSA and requested they reach out to these communities. For example, by the summer of 1920, it remained unclear whether or not the 19th Amendment would be ratified by the 36 states required. Delaware was one of the holdouts, and the NWP wrote the SWSA in May and asked the SWSA to use its ethnic identity to encourage Scandinavian Americans living in Delaware to support the suffrage cause. It's interesting to note that the NWP asked the SWSA to contact this Scandinavian American community in Delaware over the geographically closer Norwegian American suffrage organization located in Brooklyn, New York. And that may have been because Delaware was home to more Swedish Americans um, than Norwegian Americans. As kind of a side note, Delaware did not ratify the amendment until much later in 1923. As a point of reference for that, Minnesota was an early ratifier, being the 15th state to pass the amendment in September of 1919. You can go ahead and advance the slide. While we've seen some of the benefits to having an ethnic specific suffrage organization, there were also significant drawbacks, especially after 1914. And I've already discussed some of those um, drawbacks in terms of kind of these ideas about immigrants and whether or not they supported women's rights to vote. Now I wanna talk about it a little bit within the context of the war. So you can advance the slide, Robin. The onset of World War I affected European immigrant status in the United States and had ramifications for an all ethnic political organization such as the SWSA. People were especially reluctant to claim any cultural background other than American during this time. You can see right from this poster, are you 100% American? Prove it. And that at times violent backlash against immigrants after 1914 
caused many ethnic Americans to renounce their heritages and adopt dominant Anglo-cultural practices in fear of being singled out as anti-American. And in some states like Iowa, it was even illegal, right, to publicly demonstrate um, being other than 100% American, you weren't allowed to speak a foreign language in public, for example, in 1918. Although this situation was particularly acute in German American communities, its effects were far reaching in other ethnic communities as well. The desire to avoid ethnic identification during World War I affected the SWSA in meaningful ways. For example, in a letter written to Jaeger in 1914, former President Genova Martin voiced her frustration with the number of Scandinavian American women who were involved in other suffrage organizations suffrage organizations that weren't the SWSA. Martin indicated that this was because Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish Americans wanted to avoid ethnic identification. The war and the accompanying anti-ethnic climate also led the SWSA to contemplate a name change in April of 1918. At the regular meeting of the SWSA, a motion to change the name of the club from the Scandinavian Women's Suffrage Association to the Women's Citizen Association was debated. Arguments ensued about whether or not the club's ethnic identification was detrimental to the cause, and they must not have come to any agreement because a motion to defer the decision to the May meeting was accepted. In the interim, Jaeger wrote a letter to the SWSA's members about this matter, stating that although the war may have added burdens to their cause, they needed to focus on the issue of suffrage. Ultimately, the motion to alter the SWSA's name to a more Americanized version never passed. The SWSA chose to maintain its ethnic affiliation until the organization disbanded in 1920 after women's suffragists' demand for the vote resulted in the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. Thank you. And Robin, you can advance the slide. And there's my information again, um, in case you'd like to be in touch. I know that though now I've purposely left plenty of time for us to, to talk and discuss things and for me to answer questions. And so I think um, you're encouraged to use the chat to write any questions you have. And then um, they'll let me know about those questions and I'll, I'll answer them. And Robin, maybe you wanna take over with any other instructions. Thank you, Anna. That was a great talk. Um, again, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. And then um, after the recording, we can turn everybody's microphone back on and your cameras so we're not bogging down the, the feed. So if you have any questions, we'll put them in the chat. So, and I did have one question. Um, and you talked a bit, and I apologize, I think the dog is barking. Um, um, you talked a bit about the different um, economic levels of the people, of the women and their husbands. Um, were most of the leaders of the organization of the, what we would say more affluent class? Yeah, yes, yes, although, Genova Martin is kind of tricky. Um, there hasn't been much published about her at all. There's not much about her in the historical record. Um, Nanny Massenjäger, for example, was highlighted in like who's who of Minnesota women in the 1920s. Genova Martin was not on that list. Um, but in someone's master, Anya Bakken, a Norwegian master student, I think she wrote her master's like in the early 2000s or something like that. She alleges that Genova Martin's husband, at least, was working class. Um, but I wasn't able to find anything to corroborate that. And there wasn't a citation for it. Um, so I'm not really sure about Genova Martin, although she's very well connected. I don't think that she personally was of working class background, but she may have been married um, to someone. But otherwise, you no, know, the, the leaders were primarily of the kind of middle upper class elite um, and they were fairly well connected um, to other organizations and, and other people in the community. If, if I may, Anna, ask, um, I'm 
really interested in this construction of Scandinavian, which is and is not an ethnic identity, and how the women were navigating and negotiating this. And do you have a sense that Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish men uh, were engaged in a similar process of, of creating this sort of intermediate uh, or uh, umbrella kind of identity for themselves? Yeah, in terms of the Scandinavian umbrella mm -hmm. identity. Yeah. Yeah, they definitely were. Um, and we you see more of that in urban areas where Scandinavians tended to not be a majority group. Um, in rural areas, you would have more nationally based organizations like the Norwegians would often have. Um, they're more rural than Swedes and Danes. Um, you also see it in kind of populations where there aren't a lot of other um nationally based kind of immigrants. So in the West, in Utah, for example, mm -hmm. see a lot more kind of uniting together to create newspapers um, and other kind of Scandinavian publications. Often those things didn't end very well or last very long because of the tensions within, especially when we're talking about kind of language and yeah. um, newspapers, for example the Danes and the Norwegians could work together fairly easily in that way because their languages are more similar where the Swedes, uh, that often caused difficulties um, in Utah, mm -hmm. for example. That's what I know the most about in terms of the newspaper work that they did together. But yeah, so, or for example, like um, Hans Matson created the Scandinavian American Publishing Company, right? And so, and men tended to be the ones who are organizing those um, newspapers and clubs like that. So it's definitely happening amongst men as well. It's more prevalent um, in political kind of organizations yeah. or in organizations where there's just, you know, not enough people of the different nationalities to, to have something like a newspaper or like a social club or anything like that. And uh, in churches? in mutual benefit societies? Um, were they also building an umbrella identity? Not so much in churches, um, mm -hmm. at least not at this time. Mm -hmm. um, they will over the course of the 20th century, um, but they, there's a lot of tension even within the different national groups um, about different kinds of Lutheranism, for example, and they have trouble kind of working together, um, again, until we see some of those kind of ethnic ties fade away, until we see some of the linguistic ties um, fade away over the course of the 20th century, um, they will start to kind of merge um, Lutheran churches together, mm -hmm. which is how we have like the ELCA today, for example, or things like that. Um, uh, mutual aid societies, I know less about. I mean, I know national based groups had theirs, like um, the Swedish mutual insurance or things like that. I think again, over time, over the 20th century, there seems to be more of that taking place too, but not in the early 20th century quite yet, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Mm -hmm. You know, I've looked a lot at uh, Croatian immigration and the ways that a Croatian identity was developed in the United States out of people who had provincial identities and, and different dialects, if they were still in the Serbo-Croatian language, but dialects and, mm -hmm. and ways that, the, that these groups came together in the US to create something. And, and I think as, we live amidst um, people today who are from different ethnic identities in Ethiopia or different ethnic identities in Southeast Asia. You know, how are there, how can we look at history as a way to help us understand what our neighbors today are actually engaged in navigating? They may not have a map, uh, but they're navigating it. Right, right. And I mean, I think, again, too, like to outsiders, they can see these groups as just being one singular group, right? And they really don't have an understanding of 
um, the ways in which that's problematic um, mm -hmm. to think that way, but also mm -hmm. offensive and, and within these groups that there are real struggles, right? Again, like you're saying, even within um, Norwegian, for example, there's a very strong localism just because uh -huh. of the geographically um, kind of isolated communities in Norway. There, yeah, localism in the United States is really important there. So even claiming a national identity is difficult. Yeah, it's it, fascinating. And I just love that you found those membership cards and milking those membership cards for all the information that, that, that they can yield. Um, I know how much fun it is to find something like that. <laughs> Are there yeah, other, yeah. other questions out there, folks? Um, you answered my question, Anna, about the churches, which Peter asked, which was great. But going back to the membership cards, I was just kind of curious if you had a chance to look at how they recruited members, maybe in other parts of Minnesota, or how they communicated with people that weren't necessarily in the Twin Cities. I mean, I'm assuming that not everybody was in the Twin Cities. Right, yeah. Um, most of their work was based in the Twin Cities, and actually the, a lot of the work, at least the information that I have that wasn't in the Twin Cities, tended to be outside of Minnesota. They do do some work. Um, the Minnesota Women's Suffrage Association sometimes would ask them to, for example, like um, provide advice, but also maybe give some materials to other organizations in the state, like Pipestone, I know, um, for example, that they did some work there. But most of the materials that are left seem to be from either the Twin Cities area or other states or um, other countries, right? Because they're also working with the suffrage movements back in Scandinavia as well. Um, yeah, and corresponding with them. Okay, well, thank you, Anna, and thank you, Peter. Oh, thank you.